We're in 1 Corinthians. If you have a Bible, you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. We're spending our year in 1 Corinthians. It is an amazingly relevant book. I'd like us to say verse 18 together, and then I'll read on from there. So if we can say verse 18 which stops with the power of God, period, there, okay? So let's say that together. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And I'm going to go on and read now to chapter 2, verse 5. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. I think I'll stop there, pick up the other verses as we go through. Corinth. 500,000 people, no church, no Christian bookstores, no helps to follow Jesus, a wild pagan city. To be called a Corinthian meant you were a wild person. It was the Las Vegas of its day. And here comes a man named Paul. And by the word, the by the way, the word Paul, the name Paul, literally means little one. That's what the word means. Here comes Paul, this little man, into this huge city. He's going to tell us in a bit he was afraid when he came. There's nothing impressive about Paul. The only thing he has is a message about a crucified Jewish carpenter. That's the only thing he has when he comes into the city. He was a man with a message. And he was so convinced that that message had supernatural power, supernatural power, not natural power, supernatural power, that he said, this message is all I need to go into this city. And I want to suggest to you that these verses we're going to look at, this, look at this morning set forth the strategy and the plan for Westbrook Church as it goes forward. These, these words, these passages. I like history. And on April 2nd, April 2nd, 1739, a man who was 5 foot 3 inches tall and weighed 125 pounds soaking wet who'd been kicked out of every church in England, banned from churches. He was an Oxford graduate. He was brilliant. But he was invited by a friend who was only 25 years old. His friend was only 25 years old, and his friend had started preaching to coal miners in Bristol, England. And he got in touch with his friend, John Wesley, and said, you got to come here and help me do this. John Wesley said, I'm not going to preach outside. That's, that's beneath my dignity. But on April 2nd, 1739, he said these words. That's John Wesley. He said, I submitted to be more vile. And I preached outside. And he said the coal miners started coming out of their coal pits. England was in an unbelievable mess, socially and morally. And George Whitfield said he saw tears running down the black sooty faces of the coal miners, white tracks of tears, as they were hearing a message of the forgiveness of sins about Jesus. 
That's George Whitfield. He was only 25 years old when he started this. George Whitfield, in the month of May in 1739, estimated it, he preached to 500,000 people in the open air. One day, George Whitfield reckoned he preached outside in the open air to 50,000 people. Now, I don't know how many people will be in the stadium today. 70,000? 500,000 people over the course of a month. 50,000 in one day. He said, people were throwing pieces of dead dogs at me. And rotten tomatoes and stones. And he said, above me was a tree, and a man climbed into the tree and urinated on me while I was preaching about Jesus. But I didn't stop preaching about Jesus. And people were coming to Christ by the thousands. These young men and women who would go out in the open air and preach, I'm telling you, they had leather lungs and volcanic hearts. And nothing stopped them. They didn't have any money. They had no worldly power. They were banished from every church in the land. And they had a message about a Jewish carpenter who was crucified for sinners and then rose from the dead. And that message caught fire in the culture. And people were coming into the kingdom of God in droves. And John Wesley, whose picture we had up there a moment ago, the motto of his life was three words. I offered Christ. That was it. That was the motto of his life. I offered Christ. How about that for a motto for a church? We offer Christ. Not religion, not the ways of men, not ideas, but a person, a divine person, a saving person. So here comes Paul into Corinth. And he comes with a mighty message. But it's a message that the world thinks is a foolish message. It's a message that is calculated to humble the proud. It's calculated to humble the proud. Christianity is calculated to humble you. And to make you think... I need God. It's calculated to do that. Now, in Corinth, uh, there were Greek philosophers. They called themselves sophists, lovers of wisdom. And there were, there were, I guess, hundreds of them in the city. And each one had their gathering. And they were eloquent. And they were amazing. And they could spin arguments. And they could woo crowds. And people loved to talk about their favorite sophists. They were kind of like rock stars. And people loved this wisdom. And here comes Paul, and look at what he says in verse 21. In the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through its wisdom. All the wisdom of Corinth, the pinnacle of human thinking, couldn't figure God out. It couldn't answer the deep questions of the human heart. Origin, where did I come from? Nature, what does it mean to be a person? Purpose, why am I here? Destiny, what happens when I die? Human wisdom has no answer for that. So Paul comes in and he says, It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs. We want a Messiah who's going to kick the Romans out. And Greeks seek wisdom. We want ideas that will fascinate us. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So here comes Paul, and all he has, all he has, doesn't have a newsletter, he doesn't have a website. He's not on TikTok. He's not on Instagram. He has a message. And this is the message. God sent his son to this world. He was born in Israel. And he was crucified on a cross for the sins of the world. And he rose from the dead. And if you repent and believe in him, you will receive the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. 
And that's what he decided to preach in Corinth. And I would suggest to you with all my heart that that's the mandate of this church right here. As a matter of fact, the mandate of this church, we are not charged with a political agenda. We are not charged to endorse this party, that party, this idea, or that idea. We are charged to tell people about Jesus. That's the charge we have. Foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. This message dealt with the heart of the problem. When Paul came in, he had a message that didn't just talk about ideas. It talked about things like sin and guilt and death and judgment and heaven and hell. This is what he talked about. And what we bring to our world is not, we'd like to tell you how you can have a happier life. Because the person might say, well, actually, I got a happier life when I started bowling, so thank you very much. I don't need your message. Our message is not how you have a happier life. Our message is about sin and death and hell and judgment and salvation, where you've come from, where you're going, what it means to be a person, who God is. These are the big questions. Look at Romans chapter 3. I think we have a slide of it. Verse 23 and 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that comes through Jesus, whom God put forth as a wrath-bearing Savior in his blood to be received by faith. That's the problem with humanity and that's the solution for humanity. And we might want to try to impress the world, but we're not here to impress the world. We're here to tell them about Jesus. Mary said in Luke chapter 1, verses 51 to 53, that this message, the gospel, in it God has scattered the proud, he has brought down the mighty, and he has exalted those of a humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. So Paul comes into Corinth and he has the mightiest message in all the universe. And may we be convinced today that the message of Christ crucified is the mightiest message in all the universe. You have an opportunity to share with someone. They're in great need. Their life is a mess. Tell them about Jesus. Even if you bungle it and fumble your way through it. Evangelism is so important, it's worth doing wrong. Just tell them. Jesus loves you. He died for you. He'll forgive you. Believe in him. And the Holy Spirit comes with power over that message. I dare say, if you were in Corinth and you saw Paul preaching, you'd seen the sophists over here and their flamboyance and all their stuff, and then you looked at Paul, you'd probably be thinking something like this. This guy's a bit of a loser. But his message is doing something to my heart. He's talk, talking about a, a crucified Savior and a merciful God and a way out of sin and death and judgment. And something's happening on, inside of me while this guy up there, this totally unimpressive man, is bungling through this message. God's doing something. Then we have a mighty message. Next we have a powerless people. I'll pick up reading again with verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. 
God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him you are in Christ, who has become to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that it is written, let one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. We have a mighty message and we have a powerless people. Paul looks at the Corinthians and he says, now think about it. You are not the big shots of the world. And God designed it that way. We make the constant mistake of thinking somehow we have to be impressive. Listen, if I want smoke machines and a light show, I'll go to the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. I was going to say a KISS concert, but I would get in big trouble for saying that. But if I want that, I'll go get it. And they'll do it better than we'll do it. Guaranteed, they'll do it better than us. Anytime the church tries to compete with the world for coolness, the world always does it better. And Paul comes right out and says, think of yourselves. Not many of you were wise or amazing or powerful by world standards. Maybe some were, but most weren't, and most aren't. The church has always been made up of people who are a day late and a dollar short. So that God might be manifested among us. Look what he says. Three times God chose. Three times God chose what is foolish. We're not the PhDs. Some of us might have studied a bit, but we're not, we're not amazing. God chose what is weak. God chose what is lowly and despised. God designed it that way. When we think that somehow we need to ascend to earthly power and impress the world with how amazing we are, we lose all gospel power. And the world looks at us and says, you look so stupid trying to be cool. There's a little, a little theme way back in the Old Testament in the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. And the Israelites come to God, and they said, we want a king so we can be like the world. So God says, well, pick a king. And they pick the tallest man in Israel, Saul. They pick him. It's very clear in the text. They pick him because he's tall. Now, if you're tall here today, I'm not picking on you. But the whole reason they pick Saul is because he's tall. Now we'll be like the world. So what do the Philistines have? They got Goliath. They can always outdo us. So what does God have? David. Remember David? He's not even a, a mature man yet. As a matter of fact, his father, Jesse, says, I got another son named David, but you, you don't even want to think about him. It's pointless. But that's God's man. That's got Becky's loving this because Becky's not too tall this morning. Some other of you. And here is a powerless people whom God chose. God has so devised his church that no human boasting will be possible. So look around at each other. Go ahead, you can do it. Look around. Miracle. The weak. The foolish, the lowly, the despised. In Matthew chapter 11, John the Baptist is in prison and he's having a faith crisis. I like that. And he sends a delegation to Jesus and they ask Jesus, are you, are you really the Messiah? Matthew 11 verse 2. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who's to come or shall we look back? Or shall we look for another one? And Jesus answered, go and tell John what you have heard and seen. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. 
the dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news preached to them. Do you see Jesus' church there? The blind, the lame, the lepers, the deaf, the dead, and the poor. That's not a very impressive company, especially the dead. <laughs> but Jesus says, that's proof that I'm the Messiah. Proof that I'm the Messiah is that those kind of people are getting new life. He didn't say, go tell them that movie stars and the sports stars and the billionaires are all believing in me, so I must be God. He didn't say that. He went exactly the opposite. The blind, the lame, the lepers, the deaf, the dead, the poor. It's proof that I'm the son of God. A mighty message, a powerless people. And then finally, a weak witness. Look at chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my message were not with plausible words of wisdom, but in a demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but the power of God, a weak witness. Do you see what he says there? He says, when I came to you, I was proclaiming in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. You would not have hired this man to be a pastor of a church. You wouldn't have. You would have said, there's nothing about this guy. He can't even hardly put a sentence together. And he's weak. And he's afraid. And when he preaches, he trembles. We're not having him. We want someone with a PhD from a seminary somewhere. We'll have him. Never mind the fact that he has no spiritual power. And Paul says, I decided when I came to you to know nothing but Jesus. In other words, he thought about it. He thought, what's my strategy going to be when I go into this impossible culture called Corinth? What's my strategy going to be? How am I going to do this? And he thinks thusly. All I'm going to know in that city is Christ crucified and risen. That's it. And I believe that message will conquer darkness. That's it. Do we believe that? Or do we think, well, we've got to have some sort of strategy here. We've got to come up with worldly ideas. We've got to beat the world at its own game. No. I was a weak witness, and I decided with fear and weakness, and trembling, that one message would do the job. And I want to tell you today, with all my heart and all the encouragement I could pour into this wonderful church, we have the message that the world needs. And it's a message of a crucified Savior and a risen Lord who invites sinners to himself. And that's the message that that world needs. And you might think, they'll think it's folly. That's what Paul said. But to those who are being saved, it will be the power of God. I was in a prison not long ago here in Kansas, speaking to a church of prisoners. You know, the, the percentage of people who come to Christ in prison is much greater than the percentage of people out here. They come to Jesus. And there was a young man in the church in prison, a real church in, I think it was Leavenworth Prison, a real, a real church there. There was a young man there who was 19 years old. When he was 15, he murdered his best friend. He murdered his best friend when he was 15. And they tried him as an adult but said, we can't put you in a cell with another adult because you're a minor. They put him in a cell by himself with a Bible. 
and this young man all by himself in that cell with nothing but a Bible and the Spirit of God to open it to him, read that Bible and came to know Jesus for real and is following Jesus today and under a life sentence. But he knows God. And the message of the gospel undid his heart and gave him new life. It is our message. We don't have to present it with wise, wise and persuasive words. If we try, we clutter it. We get in the way of the Holy Spirit. Bungle it. But say it. Let me just tell you, Jesus loves you and he died for you. Bye, got to go. And then trust God. John Wesley said, I design plain truth for plain people. This man was an Oxford graduate. He could have spun webs of philosophy. He gave it all up. He said, I design plain truth for plain people. I labor to avoid all words which are not easy to understand and which are not used in common life. Martin Luther said this, when I preach, I regard neither the doctors nor the lawyers, and I have more than 40 of them in my congregation. I have my eyes on the servant maids and the children. And if the learned men are not well pleased with what they hear, well, they know where the door is. Wow. And Paul says this is the demonstration of the Spirit's power. The Spirit's power is not demonstrated through some whiz kid that everyone says, I have no idea what he said, but boy, it was good. That's not the demonstration of the Spirit's power. The demonstration of the Spirit's power is this. He told me about Jesus. And something happened in my heart when he told me about Jesus. I can't explain it. And look how he finishes. So that your faith might rest and not on the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's the whole point here. Our strategy is that people would have their faith rest in the power of God. People would say, God did that. God touched my heart. What's our strategy as we go forward as a church? That's it, right? We just read our strategy. There it is. It's to be confident in the gospel and present it to our world. And I'll tell you this today. Jesus loves you with an everlasting love. And he's borne your sins to avert God's righteous wrath from you onto himself. And if you will come to him and believe in him, you will be pronounced before a holy God, justified, free, and forgiven, and be given the gift of eternal life. That's the promise of God. And that's our message for the world. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, and the Holy Spirit works at that point, it is the power of God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, the blind, the lame, the lepers, the deaf, the dead, the poor. What a church, Jesus. What a church. We think of those coal miners with their tears streaming down their blackened faces, hearing the words of life. Lord, we thank you for the gospel. Lord, we thank you that what we need is right there. Thank you for Westbrook Church. Take us, Lord Jesus, and use us in this culture, in this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.